From the earliest age that I can remember, becoming a park ranger was my life goal. My father and I spent every free weekend hiking, fishing, and camping in Arlo Bennett National Forest. Not everyone is as lucky as we were to have access to 560,000 acres of pristine woodland, streams, and hiking trails. With it being a 20 minute drive, we practically lived there from Friday to Sunday evening. While I could recount hundreds of stories of our exploits in the park, I think it would be best if I stick with information pertinent to the dangers that I want to warn you of. When I was about 10 years old, my father and I had just finished setting up camp for the night. Our tent was placed, the latrine dug, and our campfire was burning warmly in front of us. After a heavy dinner and canteen of water, the call of nature indicated it was time to use the restroom. I wandered to the hole we had dug away from the campground and relieved myself. As I was zipping my jeans, there was a soft whistling sound coming from the forest ahead of me. Looking over my shoulder, I could see my father, pipe in mouth, sitting on the ground by our fire. Turning my head back to the direction of the whistling, I squinted my eyes and peered into the distance. To try and identify the source of the whistling, it was likely a bird, I thought to myself, but there were hints of a subtle melody kept me from being certain. The fading light of the sun didn't provide me with much of a view, so I continued listening to the soft whistling. Having decided it warranted no further investigation, I resolved to return to the safety of my father's company and the now much desired illumination of our campfire. I turned around and began to shuffle through the undergrowth of the forest when over my shoulder I was certain I heard someone shout from a distance. It's this way. Come and see. My fight, flight, or freeze response immediately chose the worst of all the options as I stopped dead in my tracks. Turning around quickly, I looked in the distance as I saw what I thought was the silhouette of a waving person far in the distance. They didn't call out again, but it appeared a single arm continued to wave above their head before they eventually dropped it and stepped backward, disappearing behind a monstrously large oak tree. Without another thought, I bolted the short distance back to our campsite and in a panic told my father what I thought I had seen and heard. He smiled and reassured me it was likely nothing more than another camper, but he would investigate. Shouldering the strap of his rifle and digging his flashlight from his bag, we trekked in the woods in the direction I thought I had seen the figure. My heart hammered against my chest as we slowly made gains in that direction. As we neared the massive oak I had seen from the latrine, my father began to sweep the ground with a beam of a flashlight, searching for signs of a disturbance. But there was no recent activity. The dried leaves and fallen branches seemed to be completely undisturbed. We continued maybe a quarter of a mile beyond the oak and still found no sign of another camp or any human activity at all. My father ruffled my hair with his hand and assured me it had just been my mind playing trick on me. I wanted to believe him so badly, but something in my heart told me I had seen someone or more unsettling yet, something. After getting back to our camp and settling down beside the dwindling embers of our fire, my father did something he had never done before. He began telling me a ghost story. In these woods, he started, people for over a century had told each other tales of wanderers in the woods. Beautiful melodies whistled through the trees. Strangers in the distance would wave and beckon travelers to come and see incredible things. Anyone foolish enough to follow them vanished, never to be seen again. Not understanding why he would tell me these things, I began to panic and tears pooled in the corners of my eyes. Seeing the visible discomfort, my father smiled and told me that as a boy he thought he had seen the same things, too. 
My grandfather had told him the same story when he was my age, or perhaps a bit younger. Every time they would tread the same trails that he and I hike now, he always imagined hearing or seeing the wanderers in the woods. When he told my grandfather what he'd heard and seen, he took it as an opportunity to teach him that the whistling sound was a known call of a local bird. He would also find shapes in the distance and show him how inanimate objects at a distance could produce the illusion of a man or woman watching them. I began to calm down a bit. We were deep within a massive national forest. The odds of encountering another person was slim at best. My youthful fears had gathered natural occurrences around me and organized them into an unnerving and unlikely scenario. I eased my posture substantially and smiled thankfully at my father. In all of our trips together after that, I never had the same experience again. When I began to work as a park ranger at Fire Tower 1, the experiences became so much worse than my younger self could have ever imagined. I had just finished college with a degree in wildlife conservation not long before the start of the pandemic. Needless to say, this was not a kind time for new graduates. A local pizzeria near campus had provided me steady hours and a decent paycheck throughout my studies, but with an increasing CDC recommendations and closures, my hours had dwindled to a quarter of what I had previously worked. Being hundreds of miles from home and the not-so-proud owner of a rapidly dwindling bank account, I spent hours each day filling out job applications, sending out resumes, and cold-calling every national park and forest I could locate online. Desperation was mounting daily until I had finally resolved to pack up my belongings and move back to my hometown, tail between my legs. My parents had passed away in a car accident during my sophomore year. I wouldn't be returning to a stable support system, but I was at least confident that old friends and extended family may be able to help me find gainful employment and find steady footing in my post-college life. Moving day arrived, and I finished boxing up the last of my possessions, stacking them haphazardly into the box of a rented box truck. After barely managing to get my beater of a car secured into a car tow dolly on the back of the truck, I could feel my phone buzz in my pocket. Slumping down onto the tailgate of the box truck, I fished it out and saw a red notification bubble on my mail application and checked it. The feeling of joy I can't... The feeling of joy I experienced can't be accurately described, as I read the attached email. Arlo Bennett, National Forest Hiring Authority. Your application has been chosen for Fire Tower 1 in Arlo Bennett National Forest. Congratulations and welcome to our team here at Arlo Bennett National Forest. We are excited to inform you that as a new park ranger for wildlife services, you will be stationed at Fire Tower 1. You are expected to arrive at Ranger Station 3 at address redacted, on date redacted, at or before 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Uniforms, equipment, shelter, and necessities will be provided to you as this is a 24-7 live-in posting. If you require storage for personal items you do not wish to keep in your on-site residence, accommodations will be made upon arrival. Please bring a valid driver's license, social security card, and a copy of this email to be presented upon arrival. If you have any additional questions or concerns, please contact your HR representatives during the hours of 8 a.m. Eastern Time and 17.30 Eastern Time. We thank you for your time and look forward to meeting you. Welcome to the team. Dennis Garland, Superintendent 2, Arlo Bennett National Forest. After reading the email over and over no less than ten times, tears began to run down my cheeks. Only minutes ago I was preparing to drive a box truck full of my secondhand furniture and meager possessions pointlessly toward my old hope town, but now I couldn't wait to travel down the road to my new career and what I thought would be a bright future. 
two days and one terrible roadside motel later. I pulled a box truck into a nearly empty parking lot in front of a log-sided building with a sign reading Ranger Station 3. Two well-aged jeeps sat parked side by side in front of the station, both marked clearly as Ranger patrol vehicles. I couldn't help but smile. Here I was, right where I'd always wanted to be. With a mixed sensation of pride and terror, I made my way into the ranger station and introduced myself to a man with salt and pepper hair sitting at the desk in the entryway. I introduced myself and was greeted with a vice grip of a handshake and he identified himself as Superintendent Garland. He explained to me that while he was generally not stationed at this location, it, he made it a goal to personally meet every newly hired ranger and walk them through the introductory process. Over the next few hours, we filled out a seemingly endless pile of paperwork, drank bad coffee out of chipped mugs, and I listened intently to Superintendent Garland as he explained my job duties at Fire Tower 1. None of the duties sounded unusual in any way to start. I would work in a 3x3 grid, with Fire Towers 1 to 9. For the first two weeks of the month, I would man the tower from 0500 to 1700. A reserve staff member would report to the station to give you a day off to readjust your sleep schedule for the last half of the month. The following two weeks I would work from 1700 to 0500. Each tower in the grid was staggered by the shift to watch neighboring off-duty sectors around them as well as their own. The primary concern was to watch for the inception of forest fires. Lightning strikes and unauthorized campfires were a constant concern in this area, so 24-hour surveillance was necessary. All fire tower rangers were provided with a two-bedroom, one-bathroom cabin located at the base of the tower. The cabins were fully furnished and basic sundries were provided for your first week on the job with the expectation you will provide your own groceries and toiletries thereafter. Routine maintenance of the cabin and tower was to be performed by the occupying ranger. Mr. Garland also informed me that I would work four weeks on duty with one full week off duty. Reserve staff would report to the cabin at each tower to relieve the primary attendant to allow them some rest and relaxation. The second bedroom was to be reserved for them and we were to keep it free of personal items. One exemption to this rule was in the event of a camper or hiker was retrieved during a search and rescue until they could be evacuated to the nearest town by medical staff. As he wrapped up, I was smiling ear to ear. Dream job? Check. Rent-free living? Check. After a worrying season in my life, everything seemed to be going my way. I was already making a mental checklist of what personal items to keep in the cabin, what I would need to store in the provided shed when Mr. Garland's gruff voice unexpectedly pulled me out of my daydream. One more thing, he said, eyes locking with mine. Don't travel any further than a half mile or so north of Tower One. Oh, sure thing, I replied. No problem at all, but is there uh, any particular reason? Mr. Garland stared at me in silence for a moment, and I could tell he was trying to sort out an answer. <sighs> Dangerous woods that way, son, he finally responded. Bobcats and bears. Nasty business. I nodded politely, but it wasn't a terribly satisfying answer. My father and I had camped in this very forest for years, and I had always known predatory wildlife lived throughout the entirety of the reserve area. Unless the bobcats had learned to ride the bears to hunt people down, it seemed unlikely to be any more dangerous than any other area. Regardless, it seemed like a poor plan to argue or question my new employer at that moment. He shook my hand and gave me a few pointers as he walked me to the door. I picked up a duffel bag they had prepared for me that was sitting in a chair by the door. Heading to the box truck, I tried to reignite my excitement and invigoration for my new job, but the warning the Superintendent Garland had given me circled inside my mind ominously. Don't go north. At that moment, I fully intended to adhere to the direction, but... Soon enough. 
My first week at the cabin and tower was a whirlwind of information. The ranger currently occupying my new tower, Thomas, was a reserve ranger who filled in the off weeks of fire towers 1 to 3. As he helped me unload my box truck and unhook my car, I picked his brain for every piece of advice I could think to ask for. He had worked for the ranger service here for a little less than a decade. I was surprised to learn that he had originally been offered the permanent role in Fire Tower 1. A significant pay increase from reserve status, but he had declined, stating that he loved traveling to the different towers and changing the scenery. He seemed like a very genuine, helpful man, but at the back of my mind I couldn't help but wonder if whatever could be found at the north of the tower drove him to decline the position. So do you ever do any hiking or camping when you're off duty? I asked on our last day together as we sat in the lookout booth at the fire tower. Yeah, at least once a month or so, Thomas replied. I'd say I've probably hiked or explored everything within about five miles of the fire towers. This seemed like as good a chance as any to naturally ask Thomas about the area north of the tower. I've got a pretty good grasp of the territory to the east, south, and west, but is there much worth checking out to the north of the tower? I looked intently in his direction, but he never returned my gaze. Thomas stood up quickly and began to pack his hiking bag and supplies without making eye contact. He tossed the filled bag over his shoulder and made his way to the door with the wraparound stairs. Once he had made it out of the door, he turned and looked at me with a determined face. North of the tower isn't safe, buddy. He turned and began to walk down the stairs towards his jeep. Bobcats and bears that way. Stay clear. A few seconds later, I could hear the roar of an engine and the sound of gravel scattering beneath tires as his jeep made its way down the road. I was surprised. My sudden departure and lack of formal farewell. It wasn't as if I wouldn't see him again in three weeks when he returned to give me my days off, but for such a friendly guy, it seemed like a rude exit. A bit of clarity from Thomas had been what I was anticipating, but now I was just left with a lead weight in my stomach and a slight feeling of dread. The answer had been so quick, it seemed as though it hadn't been practiced. Matched with the dash for the door, I was sure something worse than wildlife must have been located in these woods. That evening after my shift, I radioed the two towers in my grid that would be assuming the night watch to verify they were safely on shift. After receiving an affirmative message from both, I began to shut down all the tower equipment other than the radio and gather up my belongings. There was still a bit of daylight left, so I seized the opportunity to grab a few odds and ends from the storage shed to bring it to my cabin. My personal quarters were mostly organized and settled, but there was still a barren bookshelf in the corner that was begging for some of my tattered paperbacks to occupy. I dumped the old cardboard box on the floor by the bookshelf and squatted down until my rear made contact with the hardwood floor. Sitting in a cross-legged fashion, I opened the box and began to scoop out the haphazardly stored novels and arrange them on the particle board shelf. The bookshelves were full and I was just beginning to load up the top shelf with the last of my New York Times bestsellers when I noticed something was sitting behind the lip of the bookshelf. I reached my hand to the corner and pulled out a worn leather book. There were no markings on the front or back to identify what it was or who it may have belonged to. Thumbing it open to a page marked with an attached leather strip bookmark, I could see the winding loops of cursive handwriting. Not a book, so to speak, but a journal. It must have belonged to the ranger who had manned the station before me. Momentarily, I considered reading it, but decided against it. Tossing it on top of the bookshelf, I made a mental note to give it to Mr. Garland the next time I saw him, so he could return it to its rightful owner. After stowing away my books, I took the cardboard box outside and started walking down the gravel path to the storage building. There was a steel cage to place garbage inside of and to try and keep larger wildlife from rifling through the garbage. I reached down to my hip to retrieve my jingling set of keys to unlock the disposal gate. Setting the box down, I slid the key into the lock and opened the gate to toss it in. 
But just as I reached down to retrieve the box, I could hear something off in the distance. By now, the light of day was a distant memory, and my eyes had not yet adjusted to the darkness. Years of living in the city had made me forget just how dark the forest could be. I had still gone on the occasional hiking trip, camping with my classmates, but it had usually been a pay-to-stay campsite with bathroom shower combinations and paths lit with soft water bulbs. It hadn't occurred to me to switch on the light which extended to the storage shed. My visibility was aided only by the light bulb on the cabin's front porch which was being swallowed up by the walls of darkness. That's when I heard the whistling. It was soft and indistinct, but I could hear it nonetheless. Crunching of leaves and snapping of twigs in the distance accompanied the unidentifiable tune. I was unable to move as I attempted to locate the direction it was coming from, but my efforts were fruitless. While the sound seemed to be coming from one point far off in the distance, I could also hear traces of it all around me, as though the owner of the notes had placed a surround sound system in the trees. Before Thomas had left, we had gone over the camping permit logs for our grid, and there were none requested within 10 miles of my post. All of the most popular hiking trails were equally far away, so there was little to no reason for anyone to be traveling in this area at this time of night. The only trails around here were less traveled and given to more experienced hikers. Any hiker with the skill to travel these trails would also have the common sense to set up camp for the night. As I stood listening and squinting in the darkness, I couldn't help but feel like the ten-year-old boy from so many years ago. Only this time I didn't have my father to comfort me. That night around the fire, he was able to explain it all in a way that made me feel like my imagination had just run away with me. Standing here by myself, I felt none of that certainty. The whistling was becoming louder and more distinct. Where before it was a disembodied and distant sound, I could tell that the source was now moving in my direction. There was a haunting, a beautiful melody that I was now able to hear more clearly. I could also hear the more defined noise of crunching leaves and snapping twigs. It was almost hypnotizing. My eyes began to close and a relaxation began to settle into my bones where icy fear had been only moments earlier. It felt... Like it may be just a good idea to walk towards the sound of the beautiful melody. It's this way, I heard a soft voice say. Come and see. The feeling of relaxation drained from me almost as quickly as it had begun. Where the melodic whistling had lulled me into the stupor, the sudden call from the darkness sobered me to the situation. I stumbled backward toward the cabin and began to run toward the safety of the burning bulb. The sounds of my heavy footfalls as I ran ensured me that any whistling or footsteps would be out of my ability to hear. All the while though I could imagine someone or something mere steps behind me, a hand of claw outstretched toward my back and still beckoning me to come and see whatever was in the darkness of the forest. Once I reached the front door, I pushed my way inside, slammed the door, engaged the deadbolt, and slid onto the floor. My back against the door, I simply sat there panting and trying to listen for any sounds of activity outside. There was no whistling. No footsteps on the walkway or the porch. No knocking. It's just the sound of my gulping breath and the thunder of my heart against my ribcage. After a few minutes, I was finally able to collect myself enough to put a plan together. If there was someone out there, maybe they were in danger. If they weren't, they had no business on Ranger property in the middle of the night. I went to the cabin control room, and threw on the breakers to the floodlights located around the perimeter of the cabin, fire tower, and storage building. Through the blinds of the cabin, I could see the piercing beams of artificial light. Before leaving the control room, I grabbed a floodlight and grabbed a hunting rifle off the rack. Uneasily and slowly, I disengaged the deadbolt to the front door and stepped outside. The forest, now a terrifying combination of artificial light and obscenely long shadows created by the floodlights on the trees. 
I made my way back down the gravel trail toward the storage building behind the cabin. The whistling had begun just beyond the storage shed. Once by the shed, I turned on the handheld floodlight and began to sweep the tree line, looking for anyone or anything that may have hung around. Nothing. Not a single damn thing. For all the crunching leaves and breaking branches I thought I had heard, there was no sign of anything that had moved through the area recently. At least nothing larger than a squirrel. I continued sweeping the distance with the floodlight when I could hear the ping of an incoming call on Fire Tower watch radio. The sound made me jump and I was instantly relieved to realize it was an incoming radio signal and that no one was here to watch my grown self leap in terror. Already out of breath from running from the storage building in my brief control, the ascent to the top of the tower was painfully slow. I finally reached the lookout box and turned on the light. Tower 1, this is Tower 5, do you copy? I punched the button on the radio mic. I read you Tower 5, go for Tower 1. Tower 1, status check, the voice said. I can see your floodlights over here at Tower 5, everything okay? I immediately felt embarrassed and didn't want to explain this to my coworker who I hadn't even met yet. Uh, everything is all clear, I responded. I just... Uh, Thomas explained how to use the floodlight system, but I, I wanted to give a hands-on run. I'll, I'll cut them now. Everything's 10-4. Tower 5 radioed back that they understood and wished me luck. I thanked the ranger and headed back down to the cabin. To the control room to cut the flood system off. Reaching for the controls, I headed to, hesitated before cutting the system off. As scared and tired as I was, I knew I had to take one last look outside before I shut the floods off. Pulling the cord on the blinds, I opened them to look outside. In the distance, at the edge of the floodlights, I thought I could see something roughly the size of a human walking into the darkness of the wood line. My heart began to hammer all over again. I pulled my phone out of my pocket and tried to snap a picture of it before it disappeared, but it was gone before I managed to open up the application. Before I returned my phone to my pocket, a curious thought occurred to me. Thumbing through my applications, I finally found the one I was looking for. A digital compass popped up on my screen and the need bounced side to side as my hand shook. Once I was able to settle my nerves, the needle finally came to rest. It pointed to the north. To say I was on edge for the next few days would have been an understatement. The remainder of the week was my last week on the day shift before I transitioned to my two-week rotation of evening watch. While I hadn't seen anything alarming since the night Thomas had departed, I had also taken special care to avoid the opportunity. No more nighttime travel to the storage shed. No taking the trash out in the evening. If I needed to complete any outdoor tasks, I made sure to take care of them during sundown. I had mostly convinced myself that it was all my imagination, but the thought still rolled around in the back of my head that maybe I saw and heard exactly what I thought I had. Immediately after my day shift, each day I shut down all lookout equipment except for the radio and headed directly down to the cabin. My evenings consisted of a steady schedule of TV show binging, dinner, a shower, and reading in bed. The small supply of paperback books I had brought didn't provide as much entertainment as I had hoped. Most of them I had already read dozens of times and quickly thumbed through the few that hadn't lost all their appeal. The paperback I was currently trying to delve into had lost most of its luster and I put it aside on the nightstand and gazed at the bookshelf to see if something caught my eye. And that's when I saw the journal. Shuffling out of bed to the bookshelf, I scooped up the journal and returned to the bed. Initially, I had told myself it was immoral to read someone's private journal, but the odd feeling of this place gave me, and the lack of other engaging activities made it easier than it should have been, to justify reading just a few pages. 
Settling back into the blankets, I flipped open the cover to the first page and ran my hand over the indentations of the cursive writing on the page. Although I told myself I would only read a few pages that turned into about a quarter of the journal. The beginning introduced me to its writer, Gary Vincent, and his arrival to the cabin. Entry 1 was dated for roughly two years before I arrived and told the uneventful story of his early life, education, and acceptance to the ranger position at Fire Tower 1 in Arlo Bennett National Forest. Our stories were fairly similar in many respects, but Gary seemed to have skipped the period of self-loathing and desperation before his employment here. While not the most energetic or entertaining read I have ever come across, there was something enjoyable about learning the personal thoughts and feelings of who I assumed was my predecessor. Thomas had trained him as well, and the two of them seemed to have developed a good friendship, if Gary's words were to be believed. The two of them camped and hiked the area together and enjoyed their shared time in the cabin when Thomas came to relieve Gary for his R&R days. I was beginning to nod in and out of alertness when I had finished about a third of the journal when an entry jolted me back to attention. Date redacted. So there seems to be something weird going on around here. I love everything about living and working here in the forest, but now and again I just get that feeling. Something's watching me from the forest. Can't quite put my finger on why. Brings the sensation about... But it's the same feeling you get when someone stands behind you in a room and doesn't say anything. Just an electric charge sensation. Last night I was hauling the kitchen trash out to the good old dumpster dungeon when I started hearing someone whistling out in the woods. I always check the camping permits at the start and end of my shift, so if there is an emergency, I can get out to help them. The thing is, there are no permits out this far that we had on record today. I tried calling out to the person whistling, but they would just fall silent whenever I did. A few minutes later, the little tune would pick back up. I'd try calling out again, but it was the same. No more whistling for a minute. There was a time or two I thought someone was telling me to come and look at something, but I'm not sure. I headed into the control room and grabbed a flashlight to search the area, but after a half hour or so of stumbling around in the woods, I called it quits. Didn't see anyone or hear any more whistling. Haven't really been out here all that long. But maybe the lack of daily interaction with people is just making my mind funny. Don't know. But not too worried about it. If whistling is the worst I hear, I think I'm in pretty good shape. I read the passage over again and again. Almost the same thing had happened to Gary. The only noticeable difference between the two events was my total panic compared to Gary's cool and collected approach to investigate the area. I know that he had not experienced the same event as a child that I had, but it was almost impossible to believe that this wouldn't have seemed kind of strange to him. A second difference dawned on me. Gary hadn't seen anyone in the wood line. I wasn't positive that I saw a person, but I was certain I had seen something. To engage with the similarities of the journal, I knew I would be up for the rest of the night until I finished it. I got out of bed again and headed into the kitchen to make myself a pot of coffee. After the ancient machine spilled the last drop into the pot, I poured a mug full and settled into the kitchen table to continue my readings. The pages immediately following the whistling event were more of the same day-in, day-out stream of thought journal entries you would expect, until about three months later. Date redacted. This place is starting to mess with my mind a little bit. I was outside last night doing my usual dumpster run when I started hearing that damn whistling again. I'd forgotten about it and the last time it happened until 10 or so of last night. Tossed the trash in the can when the whistling started up. The flashlight was already in my pocket this time, started carrying it a few weeks ago just as a precaution. I could hear the whistling louder this time and something about it just made me happy. Just felt like I could wander in that direction and listen to it a bit closer if I could find who was making that beautiful noise. Kind of made me sad too though. Not sure why. I turned on the flashlight and started walking north into the woods to see if I could find out who it was. I called out and asked who was there and the whistling again. 
This time, someone shouted back. It's this way. Come and see. I asked them what it was, but no one answered. When I started walking towards the sound of the voice, I could hear footsteps and whistling walking away from me, so I called out again for them to wait so I could talk to them. And they just repeated the same thing. It's this way. Come and see. By now I figured there must be something to check out, so I kept walking after them. Maybe someone was hurt. The melody of that whistling made the traveling feel a little bit easier, though. I felt kind of happy, like something good was going to happen. The woods were starting to get thicker by now, and I wasn't gaining on them. They always seemed to be just the same distance in front of me that they had been the entire time. Occasionally I would catch a glimpse of someone in my flashlight beam and I'd call out, but still the same thing. It's this way. Come and see. Eventually I came to a cluster of oak trees that were so tightly packed together it looked like one monstrous tree. When I got to it, the whistling stopped for a little while, and suddenly I felt sad and alone. My eyes teared up, and I wasn't sure why. Then the whistling tune came back, like it sensed that I needed to get in to be happy. It sounded like it was up on the top of the trees. I tried shouting for them again a few times, but no one answered at first. After a few minutes of trying to get their attention, I finally heard someone reply, It's up here. Come and see. Up where? I asked the voice. In the trees. Just use the stairs. The voice called back. I ran the flashlight around the base of a bunch of trees, and in the center of them I could see what looked like a step. Inching closer and leaning between the two of the oaks, I could see a damn spiral staircase running up the center of the trees and into the foliage. For a moment, it felt like the right thing to do, just grab onto the banister and climb up to the top. My foot was settling onto the bottom step when a sudden beeping and vibration startled me back to my senses. My smartwatch was beeping loudly, and when I looked down at my heart rate, it was nearly 150 beats a minute. I saw the time, too. It had only been 10 o'clock when I headed out to take the trash, but it was almost 11.30 now. It seemed like I had only been in the woods for maybe 15 minutes, but it had been an hour and a half. I panicked and headed back in the direction of the cabin. As I made my way back, there was a remnant of an old hiking trail that took me within a stone's throw of the cabin. It took me almost two hours to get back. My body aches and I feel like I have the flu. I'm not sure what the hell that was, but... I'm gonna have to call this in at the start of my shift. My heart raced as I continued to read the journal. On the next few pages, Gary recounted how he had called in the staircase to Superintendent Garland the next day, and that a team of rangers had met him at the cabin. They traveled back to the location where Gary had seen the stairs, but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Gary begged them to come back at night, because maybe it would be visible to them then. The other rangers agreed to this to help calm Gary's concerns, but when they arrived there later that evening, the cops of trees still didn't hold a staircase. The journal entries from this point became almost incoherent in their format. Gary was fixated on how the stairs had disappeared and why they couldn't find them. He admitted to traveling back multiple times but never seeing them again. The absence of the whistling from unseen entities also seemed to bother him rather than soothe his concerns. He wrote endlessly but missing the beautiful melody and that it maddened him that he couldn't remember all of the notes. Then there were no entries for a long time. When Gary wrote what would be his final entry in the journal, he seemed to be a man who had lost grips on reality. The music didn't return to me. I'd been so sad without it. The gentle melody haunted my mind, even though I couldn't quite remember how it sounded. So I traveled back again, down the forgotten path. I traveled north, traveled to that unusual copse of trees, and there it was. The stairs were there. Thank God they were there. No one was whistling and no voice invited me up, but I knew that I needed to go. I belonged there. With them. With him. 
He was waiting for me. The banister felt so good under my hand as I made my way up into the foliage. Through the foliage. Into my new home. Everyone is in unison there. The many are one. I came back here to say goodbye. To someone. Was someone here I knew? I'll just say goodbye to you, Journal. I am going back. I know I will stay. I want to be in unison. Maybe I can help others find their way there. I hope you will let me help. So many souls can be one if they will let themselves go. To anyone who reads these words, I tell you it is true. It is this way. Come and see. And that was it. Nothing but blank pages followed this final entry. I was shaking as I closed the leather cover and stared into my empty coffee cup. The sun was creeping over the tops of the trees now and I knew that if I didn't move soon I would be late for the start of my shift. I put on a fresh pot of coffee and began to ready myself for my shift in the days. The journal stayed clutched in my hand as though it were some talisman that might protect me from Gary's fate. I didn't know exactly what I would do in the long run. But for now, I knew I had to get to my post. Months had passed since I had discovered the journal. Spring had arrived, but the long hours of sunlight and more agreeable weather hadn't improved my mood. I would periodically hear the whistling in the woods on evenings when I didn't have to work. The height of the fire tower probably just made it impossible for the melody to reach my ears when I worked nights, but I always assumed it was there. When the whistling would begin in the evenings, I'd taken to wearing earplugs. It seemed to keep me from feeling that unreasonable sensation to follow the sound. Although it had yielded little satisfactory information, I shared the journal and its contents with Mr. Garland and Thomas. Mr. Garland explained that Gary Vinson had been a stellar employee for the department about two years, but confided in me that he had a history of mental illness. While they explained his complicated situation, Thomas handed me a photo of Gary. He was a few years older than me with bright red hair and a huge smile. They told me that Gary suffered from something similar to schizophrenia that was controlled well with his medications. Once Gary went missing, Thomas said he had discovered that Gary had not been taking his pills for a month or longer. He had taken to traveling into the northern forest more frequently in the last few months. He remained at his post. Thomas, Garland, and a host of other rangers had traveled to the location with Gary. He claimed he had seen the stairs, and there was never anything there. Each unsuccessful search seemed to cause him to become a little more distant from them, until eventually they all quit talking unless it had to do with work. The two of them implored Gary to seek help, but he never did, and then he vanished into the woods. The subsequent search for him only turned up his tattered uniform, jacket, and wallet. For my part, I continued doing my job. I liked the night shift the best because there was no whistling. Staring out into the darkness for hours looking for potential fires was soothing. My phone ran a constant stream of music to keep me company. When I worked the day shift, I would bring Gary's journal with me and study it as though perhaps I would discover some secret to his madness. But I never did. It just seemed to provide my own madness. I was obsessed with what had happened to him. I can't honestly tell you why I decided to do what I did next, but the mystery had become more than I could take. Thomas arrived to start my week of R&R, and I told him I planned to do some camping, and he would have the cabin to himself for a few days. 
The day earlier, I had already loaded the ATV in the storage shed with camping gear and extra gas. I was going to go find this damp staircase. As soon as Thomas started his shift, I fired up the ATV and headed on the one trail to the east of the tower, so he would be less likely to surmise my plans. I drove the ATV in a wide arc around the Tower 1 sector until I was about a quarter mile due north of the tower. It took me a while, but eventually I found the rutted trail that Gary had written about in his journal. The trip was uneventful, and with the use of the ATV, I reached the tightly gathered copse of trees that he mentioned. I slid off the ATV and approached the cluster of trees with caution. They formed a circle with a three-inch foot gap facing towards the south. The canopy shadowed the inside and I couldn't see anything. With a lump in my throat, I pulled the floodlight off the ATV and shone it into the circle of trees. Nothing. My pulse relaxed and my body tension eased. The staircase wasn't there. I felt a mixture of joy and sadness. Gary had seemed so sure of what he had seen and now I felt sure he had been suffering from some sort of mental illness. Walking inside the copse of trees, I couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. Feeling content that the staircase was a fantasy, I decided to make the most of my days off and follow through with the camping trip. The day was warmer than the seasonal average, so I chose to forego the tent and camp under the stars. I would only be staying overnight, so I opted not to dig a latrine, and concentrated on setting up a comfortable fire after clearing the brush. Even with the unusually warm day, I still gathered an abundant amount of firewood just in case it took a substantial dip in temperature. After a quick meal and a few chapters in one of my ragged paperback novels, I decided it was time to turn in for the night. I settled into my sleeping bag and enjoyed the heat from the stone room fire. Sleep came quickly due to the combination of exhaustion from my recent sleepless nights and the revelation that Gary's staircase to nowhere didn't really exist. Sometime during the night I awoke suddenly to a familiar sound. The melody I had avoided for so many months now was filling my ears and it was coming from directly behind me. I rolled over and looked into the copse of trees and standing in the gap between the oaks was Gary. I recognized his wide smile and fire red hair from the photo Thomas had shown me. His hair was sprouting in random directions and his tattered ranger's uniform hung off of his emaciated frame, but it was Gary. Gary? I asked in a daze. Gary just continued to smile as he stepped backwards and was enveloped in the darkness of the circle of oak trees. I could hear what I swore were the thuds of hiking boots on wooden boards, and springing up from my sleeping bag and grabbing the flashlight, I yelled Gary's name again. It's up here! Come and see! He replied in a manic voice. I turned on the floodlight and aimed it into the trees, expecting to see him hunkered inside, but to my shock, the beam of the floodlight gleamed off of a polished mahogany banister. There was a beautifully crafted circular staircase in the center of the trees, and lifting my floodlight, I caught the bottom of Gary's boot as he ascended the stairs. Shouting his name, I sprinted inside. Gary, no! I shrieked. My hand grasped the smooth, cold wood of the banister and I began to climb the stairs in their tight circle. Come back, man. We need to get you some help. I could only hear the thuds of his footfalls as he continued up the stairs. My pulse was racing as I bounded up behind him, clinging tightly to the banister. Leaves and branches traced the side of my face as we both climbed higher into the trees. The beam of the floodlight bounced and weaved between smooth mahogany wood and dense foliage. As hard as I climbed the stairs, I could hear that Gary was getting further and further ahead of me. My pace was beginning to slow, but I still clung to the banister and used it to pull myself up as I tried my best to reach this man racing ahead of me. The smoothness of the banister began to change under my hand as I climbed higher, and what had been an unblemished surface had started to feel bumpy and rigid on my palm. I was starting to breathe heavily through my mouth, and I knew I would need to stop to catch my breath. 
After an unknown amount of time bounding up the staircase, I decided to stop. To catch my breath. The beam of my flashlight was pointed down at the stairs, but they looked different now than when they had first appeared. Where they had been once a rich brown at the bottom, they now appeared the color of half-burnt charcoal. I traced the light up higher to get a better view of my surroundings and discovered why the banister felt so different. The smooth wood had transitioned into what appeared I... I could only describe it as an unending spinal cord. The bones curled upward by the charcoal-colored steps. The foliage around me, which had been budding and green when I started my ascent, was now a sticky, sickly purple of a healing black eye with throbbing veins running around the leaves. Balls of what looked like black dew dotted the tops of leaves, and I noticed that anywhere this dew made contact with my clothes, they were now developing small holes and I could smell the light scent of chemicals burning and hints of decay. The branches of the trees made sudden pattern changes from obsidian to ashen white. I began to scream and to turn back from the stairs when I saw the section of steps below me crumble and fall away into nothingness. There was no way I had climbed more than the equivalent of six flights of stairs, but I watched as chunks of burnt charcoal stairs and spinal cord banister drifted off into a hellish purple chasm. As I tried to regain my composure and figure out what to do next, I could feel the step below me beginning to crack and sink. And without a second thought, I began to run up the stairs as quickly as I could. All the while, I could hear the step just behind me crumble and fall into the purple nothingness below. There would be no more breaks to catch my breath. I couldn't even afford a glance backward unless I wanted to end up drifting off into whatever hell was below me. The air seemed to be getting thinner and had the tang of rotten meat. I could feel my legs buckling and struggling to keep up with the stairs and I knew I would soon fall back into the hellscape below me. Just as I felt the last of my strength give way, my hand reached for another section of the spinal banister and found none. My foot rose up one more burnt charcoal step but instead extended forward and found no purchase and I fell forward onto level ground. My floodlight was flickering, but I could see the ground was made of something gray and writhing. It was damp to the touch, and I could feel it pulse beneath my palms. I jumped up in a panic to get my hands off the disgusting material, and my eyes met the horizon. The sky, a flowing purple and full of a thick fog. There was no variation to this gray terrain I was standing on. Endless plains in all directions were all I could see. Dotted over the entire landscape were what I originally thought were leafless trees. But as my eyes focused on the unearthly light, I could see that they were people, with their arms raised, reaching toward the sky. I could see that some of their feet were held in place by skeletal hands emerging from the ground, while others seemed to be growing into the gray mass like plants. Their eyes glowed softly with the same purple light as the sky. And all at once, the numberless horde turned their heads towards me and spoke. We are many, but we are one in him. Thousands of voices said in unison. You have heard this beautiful song, and now you will sing it with us forever. A few yards in front of me stood Gary. The same sick purple glow flowed from him. But he stood with his arms to his sides. He motioned with both hands to a spot just beside him and smiled. And on the ground where he pointed were two writhing skeletal hands, and I knew he wanted me to take my place there and become part of this twisted place. Only I was starting to feel like perhaps it wasn't as twisted as it first seemed. The melody I had heard so many times and the whistling in the woods echoed everywhere now. The forest of skyward-reaching people produced an overpowering sound as they all whistled the same hauntingly beautiful melody. I started to walk towards Gary and thought that this all made sense. Everyone here looked so happy. The purple of this world was even beginning to become beautiful to me. I was about halfway to Gary when I halted for a moment and looked over my shoulder and saw there was an opening on the ground where the stairs had been. My head darted from side to side, and I could see more of these openings on the ground between the swaying forest of humans. There must be hundreds of these staircases leading up to this world. From my world, I realized. 
bringing people from our world to this brainwashing hellscape. Looking back at Gary, I could see that same smile as before, but now there was a nervousness to it. It was almost pleading with me to step beside him and accept those skeletal hands as they wrapped around my ankles. Then I noticed the tears running down his face and the ever so subtle shaking of his head. He was trying to tell me no. Before I could ask him to tell me where I was, what the hell was going on, what is happening here, I was startled by the deafening sound that I could only compare to a foghorn. The ground beneath me shook and the beautiful melody from the forest of people suddenly turned into blood-curdling shrieks. Their hands dropped from the sky and covered their ears, and I did the same. A second boom of foghorn noise came, and the writhing force lifted their heads and all opened their mouths at the same time. Thin streams of blue and yellow smoke drifted out of them and into the distance. They began to collect into a stream and drifted off into the distance. And as I looked at the point that this strange beam drifted to, I could for the first time see the outline of the thing. The colossal silhouette was robed in fog, but I could still make out its shape. It towered above the field higher than anything I had ever seen. It seemed to sprout out from the ground into a sickeningly thin torso with arms so thin they seemed like they could snap if they were made to hold any weight. At the end of these bony arms I could see clawed hands scooping up people trapped in the grey ground in front of it. The thing had an oval-shaped head with two downwards curling horns protruding from it. A cavernous mouth full of slender, sharp teeth opened. It shoved handfuls of screaming people into its mouth as it seemed to simultaneously drink the blue and yellow smoke from the air. They are blessed to become one with him, the forest of humans shrieked. He will welcome you too, come and see. The appearance of this eldritch horror was more than I could bear. I stumbled backwards and fell to the ground as the grey mass writhed underneath my hands again. Using my feet to push myself back towards the hole I had emerged from, I looked at Gary. He was still crying, but now he was nodding in agreement as I got closer to the hole. I could see that he was held in place by the same type of writhing hands he was gesturing towards. I broke my gaze with Gary and looked into the sky at the impossibly large abomination towering over the forest of tortured souls and saw its massive hand breaking through the fog and reaching for me. Without another thought, I pushed myself back into the hole and closed my eyes. At this point, floating in an endless void it was better than allowing that ageless horror to consume me or add me to its blasphemous garden of souls. The sensation of falling was sickening and terrifying as my stomach began to ball up tightly. I could feel myself moving faster and faster as the purple void swirled around me. Closing my eyes, I prayed I would die soon to spare me from the hellish nightmare. And that is when I began to feel a sharp pain in my back as something began to strike me. I opened my eyes, but it was almost completely dark now. My body was slamming against solid objects, and the wind was being knocked out of me over and over again. My descent began to slow, and I could feel soft and angular things brushing against my body, and my face as I continued to be pummeled after blow after blow. My eyes were beginning to focus on the glowing light, and I could see that I was slamming into tree branches. Extending my arms, I was able to briefly grasp onto them and slow my fall. After what felt like hours of falling, I eventually landed with a sickening thud on the ground. And everything went black. When I came to and opened my eyes, I was in front of the abnormal circle of trees lying in the dirt. I sucked in panicked breaths as I saw the smooth mahogany stairs only feet in front of me. My entire body ached as I pushed myself up and staggered to the ATV to retrieve the gas can. Fuel spilled out of the upturned can as I dumped the contents at the foot of those hellish stairs. I pulled a book of matches from my pocket and flicked it into the trees. And a rush of warmth hit me as the fire swallowed the stairs and the trees surrounding them. I fell backward and blacked out again. I woke up in the hospital in my hometown. Thomas was asleep in an armchair beside my bed. He awoke when I started shifting in the bed while attempting to make myself comfortable. My left arm was in a cast, as well as my left leg. Reaching up to scratch my head, I could feel missing patches of hair. My entire body was covered in bruises and cuts. 
Thomas told me that they had found me after he spotted rising smoke from the lookout booth in Fire Tower 1. When the rangers and forestry services arrived, they had found me at the foot of the blazing trees. I'd been in the hospital now for three days and had been in and out of consciousness. He asked me repeatedly what had happened, but I lied and told him I wasn't sure. After Mr. Garland was informed I was awake, he stopped by for a visit too. It was pretty similar to my visit with Thomas. He told me what had happened from his perspective and asked what had taken place. Already practiced at lying about this, I told him I didn't know. I had gone camping and woke up in the hospital. I wasn't fired from my job, but I never returned. The ranger service investigated the fire, and while they were able to ascertain it had been intentionally set, I wasn't suspected due to my battered state when they discovered me. Last I had spoken with him, Thomas told me he had accepted the full-time position at Fire Tower 1, and I wished him good luck. As for me now, I've taken a traveling position with the National Forestry Service. I travel the country performing survey studies of the national forests under our care. It's been nice to see the country, and I still spend every available moment I have hiking and camping. My motivation is a bit different now. In every new town I travel to for my job, I always ask the locals if there are any local legends about whistling in the woods. And I'm always looking for staircases in places they should not be. I'll never forget what I saw in that purple-tinted hellscape. What haunts me the most is remembering those hundreds of holes that I knew must lead to hundreds of different staircases. I always listen for whistling in the woods now. And I always carry an extra can of gasoline. All right, that's it for this uh, incredible fire lookout story. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the author, uh, GTrip14. Please check out his work on Reddit if you haven't done so already. And if you have, go check it out again, because he's a fantastic author, as, as evidenced by this really great story. Um, so if you enjoyed this story, uh, go look on Reddit for GTrip14. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Please tune in for next video. It will be tomorrow at 4 p.m., as always. Uh, upload every day at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks for watching the channel. Please like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. And have a great night. See you next time.